tell me, why is it that there is something it is like to be me? Why is it that there is something it is like to be you? How is this possible? Uh, well, there are two questions there. The one is, the one is why uh, there is something it is like to be me or to be you. And the other is, how is that possible? Mm. Um, the, the, the why question, I believe, has everything to do with the, with the fact that the fundamental, and I say fact, uh, and I'll, I'll have to substantiate that later, but it has everything to do with the fact that the fundamental form of consciousness is feeling. Mm -hmm. In other words, affect. Um, and affect arises from a monitoring of our homeostatic imperatives. Um, we, we living things have to remain within certain viable bounds. Um, and simpler creatures have reflexive um, mechanisms which maintain them within those bounds. But obviously, reflexes have a limited uh, generalizability. There are many situations that living things find themselves in which are unpredicted mm -hmm. uh, by their evolutionary uh, past. And so they can't navigate uncertain or novel uh, situations. And so uh, most of them expire in those mm -hmm. situations. Um, but uh, a few, a lucky few survive because they just happen by chance to do the right thing. Um, and then they have progeny. And so that contributes to the evolution of those reflexes. Um, there's therefore an enormous advantage, an enormous adaptive advantage uh, for creatures to be able to experience how they're doing. Uh, is this going well or is this going badly? Uh, when, when, um, when acting voluntarily, in other words, not reflexively, not automatically, mm. uh, they now can, by trial and error, uh, try different things out. And if it's going well, uh, then they feel it. Uh, this, this, this feels like a relief. Um, and uh, if things are going badly, uh, the opposite applies. And so they avoid what feels bad and they approach what feels good. And in this way, uh, as I said a moment ago, they, they have the enormous advantage of being able to navigate un, unknown, uh, unpredicted, novel, uh, uncertain situations. And then to learn from the experience during life rather than for it to require generations uh, of, uh, 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 of phylogenetic learning, in other words, yeah. a, a, learning, a learning by natural selection, or, or rather adaptation by natural selection. So uh, I, I believe I, with others, uh, it's not my own uh, idea. Uh, this is a building on the work, first of all, of Jacques Panksepp, uh, and secondly, of Antonio Damasio and others. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that, that affects are an extended or feeling is an extended form of homeostasis. Um, there, you can see in what I've just said, uh, there's an intrinsic value system. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the value system of, of all living things, uh, the value system which simply, simply un underwrites the whole of evolutionary biology, is that it is good to survive uh, and bad not to. So, so the the, the, so good feelings uh, predict your likely survival mm. uh, and, and bad feelings predict your likely, your likely demise. So that's the valence, as we call it, the valence of, uh, of affect, the unpleasure, pleasure dimension. Uh, it, is, it, it is intrinsically valenced, mm -hmm. um, doing, doing well and doing badly. In order to make choices, and remember, that's what I'm speaking about, the, the animal having now the capacity to make choices, in other words, to not uh, behave compulsively according to reflex, um, has to, that, that capacity has to be rooted in a value system because how else do you make a choice? Mm. Uh, something has to be better than something else. So there has to be some value system which determines what's good and what's bad. And, and that's what I've just uh, explicated. Now, on top of that, um, we have multiple needs. Uh, we complex creatures have multiple needs, but actually you don't need to be that complex a creature to have multiple needs. Um, you know, like, for example, to have 
energy balance needs uh, and thermoregulation needs mm. uh, and um, hydration needs, you know, and oxygenation needs, uh, you know, there you have four. And uh, so, and each of these has to be met in their own right. Um, so, so you can't reduce them to a common denominator. You can't say, I have, um, I have eight out of 10 need for sleep and a two out of 10 need for nutrition. Uh, mm -hmm. Therefore, I have a 10 out of 20 total need. So all I need to do is sleep and I'll reduce the number uh, and, and never eat. You, know, <laughs> you, you have to do them both. So why I'm, uh, why I'm emphasizing that is that this is something in addition to valence. Mm -hmm. uh, we, also have, we also have categories of need. So valence is a continuous variable. Uh, you know, it's the, the, you can say from, from, from minus 50 to plus 50, that's the range of badness to goodness. Um, but but uh, the categorical variables that represent our different needs are by definition, because they're categorical variables, mm -hmm. they are qualitatively distinguished from each other. So, so, uh, so this is why feelings uh, have both a goodness and a badness and a, a particular quality so that sleepiness feels different from hunger um, and from thirst and from respiratory distress and so on. Um, so that's the, you, when you said, why uh, is there something it is like to be me or to be you? Uh, I believe in, in, in the most basic uh, uh, form of consciousness, that's why. It enables us to know how we're doing to have to, to evaluate how we're doing, and it and it is necessarily qualified. In other words, qualia arise from the fact that we have multiple such needs. Then there's the 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 the, the, the second step, uh, which is if I can, if, you know, obviously the simple creatures that first evolved. When I say simple, I don't want to be derogatory. They're not that simple <laughs> as I as I keep saying. Yeah. But the first creatures that evolved feeling. Um, they weren't verbal, so they wouldn't have been able to say what I'm now going to say, but it's as if their feelings say, I feel like this, you know, it tells you how you're doing. And then secondarily, it's a matter of, I feel like this about that. And so feeling gets extended onto perception and mm -hmm. cognition. So because you have to develop policies about what you're going to do. Um, and so and so affect is the fundamental form of consciousness, which then gets extended onto, onto cognitive and perceptual mm -hmm. consciousness, which gives rise uh, to, 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 to the forms that dominate our uh, conscious experience. Uh, um, because our capacity to plan and think about what we're going to do is so, so highly developed. The second part of your question you know, about, about how does this happen well, I've partly uh, described uh, the mechanisms of how it happens, but if you're asking about the hard problem, in other words, you know, how does how does physical uh, physiological uh, processes of the kind that I've just described, how do they turn into, uh, how do they somehow transform uh, into subjective experiences? That's another story. So you'll have to tell me if you want me to go into that. Or not. <laughs> I th Look, okay, I, there's so much to touch on. I mean, for, first of all, I just for the listeners um, or for the viewers, uh, we're both in South Africa. This is quite cool because it's the first time I'm actually chatting to someone in the same time zone. We're both in Cape Town. And um, just for everyone who's wondering why the screen's so dark on your side, it's because in South Africa, we have what's called load shedding. Where our country just does not give us electricity every now and then. <laughs> so Mark's on, on, unfortunately on the one side of it right now just for some context for the viewers. But okay, Mark, let's, let's, talk, let's go to the hard problem. I mean, I've read The Hidden Spring. I mean, I've read The Neuropsychology of Dreams. Your, your writing is very fascinating. I like the way you're sort of blending um, neuropsychology, neuropsychoanalysis into neurobiology and trying to link these fields together. So you're definitely working at that interface between mind and body. So let's discuss the hard problem. What are your thoughts on this hard problem of consciousness? Is there a problem? I mean, this podcast is called Mind Body Pro Solution because the aim is to find a solution to this problem. Do you think we're able to find it using what your theory sort of claims? 
Well, um, I don't claim to have solved the hard problem, but okay. I do claim to have to have given us a hint as to what direction we, we need to go in um, in order to be able to do so. Yeah. Um, so let me unpack uh, that story. Um, I could I could do it in two ways. Let me let me preface it with with the first way, and then I'll come to the second way, which I'll tell you in more in more detail. Um, I think that the hard problem arose because we focused on visual perception as our model example of consciousness. In fact, I might go further and say we focused on human visual perception as our model example of consciousness. Um, and of course, uh, conscious vision has everything to do with, with cortex. Yes. Um, so I, I might sort of, you have to start somewhere. So, so let's start with Francis Crick's uh, famous book uh, from 1994, uh, it was called um, it was called the the astonishing hypothesis, yes. uh, and the the subtitle was the scientific search for the soul, um, and there he he explicated a, a, a methodological program as to how we might go about uh, sort of um, saving uh, the problem of consciousness from philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. rescuing it. Uh, and bringing it into into natural science, and and he 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 proposed this concept of the neural correlate of consciousness. He said all we need to do, uh, consciousness is nothing special. You know, it's just another just another biological function. All we need to do is find the anatomical and physiological substrate of this function. Uh, in other words, we need to identify its neural correlate. Um, we need to. Uh, then it, once we've isolated that correlate, we can start seeing, okay, well, what is the, how does this thing work? Because this must somehow explain, you know, why there's something it's like to be you and me. Um, that's a sort of reasonable, commonsensical mm -hmm. reductionist strategy. Uh, but, but the unfortunate uh, choice, uh, as I just said, is that he focused on, on human vision mm -hmm. um, as, and I say it's unfortunate, but it's not, it's not difficult to understand why. I mean, human consciousness is dominated by visual perception. Um, and also more cortex is given over to visual perception than any other form. And um, we understand it rather well. So, so um, it seemed like a reasonable place to start. Why I think it was an unfortunate place to start is First of all, you shouldn't start with human beings, the most complex you know, uh, uh, form of consciousness. Um, and, uh, you know, cortex um, is many, the, 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 this is more fundamental point. The, the, the function of visual perception does not require consciousness. Mm. Uh, you, you, you can have visual perception without consciousness. So, um, when the very next year after um, Crick's book uh, was published came David Chalmers' famous paper uh, in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, uh, where he said, well, you know, why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark and etc.? I don't need to tell you uh, what, he, what he said. But um, I think it was a reasonable question from Chalmers, mm. precisely because visual information processing can go on in the dark. So. Um, it is mysterious. Why? Why do we? Why does it have to feel like anything at all? Uh, we we know that not only the the superior colliculi can see unconsciously, but uh, you know the the visual cortex can see unconsciously, and it can discriminate things like pretty elaborate um, uh, things like color. You know, mm -hmm. you can you can discriminate color unconsciously. So why does it there have to be something it is like? Uh, to experience red uh, versus blue, um, if you can discriminate them without experiencing mm -hmm. um, th Now that, I do not believe, applies to feelings. You mm -hmm. can't have a feeling without feeling it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've just explained to you uh, why we feel our feelings. It is, it is, a, it is a necessarily a subjective a, a monitoring of my own state. Uh, with existential consequences for me, 
uh, and it has to have this goodness and badness, has to have value, uh, mm -hmm. and it has to have a, a, a categorical uh, qualitative differences. So, you know, had we started there, uh, had we started with affects, which are not generated cortically, and that's another big story, mm -hmm. um, they are generated, they are generated in the in the midbrain for the most part, but certainly they are generated subcortically uh, in general. Had we started with those much more ancient, much simpler uh, uh, structures, um, I think that the hard problem would never really have arisen. I think mm. it's, you know, to say, why must you feel pain? Uh, you know, why must you feel hunger? This is mysterious. Why don't you have, why don't you unconsciously navigate uncertainty and make choices of existential consequences within qualitatively distinctive variables? And it's just, well, you know, it just is when you describe that function, you're just describing a feeling. Mm. And feelings, as I've said, feelings have to feel like something. Uh, unlike visual perception, which does not have to. So that's the the, the first. Uh, I said I'm going to tell the story in two parts. That's the that's the the first part. But let me now move from neuroscience to to a more sort of philosophical uh, perspective on this thing. Um, I said the question, uh, the hard problem, put in its most basic form. You know, is as Searle put it. You know how. How does the brain get over the hump from electrochemistry to feeling? You know, how do electrochemical processes turn into feelings? Literally turn into them. You know, mm. What kind of weird metaphysical transduction occurs there? Um, and, and here I think the problem is that the, 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 the physiological processes do not turn into experiences. I think... This is remember, I'm saying this is a philosophical perspective. Yes. I think it's a matter of observational perspective mm -hmm. on point of view. So um, you know, if you if you look at the um processes going on in my brain uh when I am feeling, let us say, uh, excitedly motivated. Uh, you will see activation of mesocortical, mesolimbic dopamine circuitry. And you literally will see it. If you, for example, put me in a positron emission scanner, you will see that circuitry lighting up. And you can, you can use all sorts of methods um, to you know, drill down into what exactly is going on physiologically there. But that's looking at me from the outside. I mean, you are now looking at me in the dark from the outside. Um, and you're seeing a body, yes. uh, and you can then, you know, you can start scanning uh, this body, and you can see in in more granular detail what's going on within it. But the the crucial issue is you're taking an external observational perspective on me. Mm -hmm. I, uh, on the other hand, have another observational perspective on me that is being me. I am me, so I have another perspective which is the subjective. Mark Solms as a subject as opposed to Mark Solms as an object. Mm -hmm. um, so I can look at myself in the mirror and I recognize, oh yeah, that guy's me, it's Mark Solms. Uh, but I could also, when I first wake up in the morning before I've even opened my eyes, um, I can have this dawning subjective experience of being me and that can only be described as my mind. Mm -hmm. um, then I stagger over to the bathroom, look at myself in the mirror and that's my body. Uh, but both of them, are me. So, you know, they're not two of them. There's only one of them. There's only one Mark Solms. Yes. Uh, it's just that we're observing him uh, from two different perspectives. So, so to say, how does, how does my subjective experience of being me uh, produce the physio, or, or I should rather put it the other way around, how does the physiological uh, embodied version of me produce uh, the subjective experience of me is like asking, you know, how does something objective uh, produce something subjective? Objectivity doesn't produce subjectivity. They're two different perspectives. Um, now, the, the, if we are one and the same thing, you know, then uh, it's, it's like, actually, let me use another analogy, lightning and thunder. You know, with, you, with your ears, you hear a clap uh, of thunder. With your eyes, you see a flash of lightning. But they're two different things you know mm -hmm. the, 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 the they're utterly different 
uh, uh, perceptions, but but they're not they're not actually two different things. They're two different manifest. Depends what perceptual perspective you take on it. Is it an auditory perspective or is it a visual perspective? We don't ask. It would be unreasonable to ask. How does lightning turn into thunder? You know, mm. we, we we realize these are two different ways of 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 perceiving the same underlying process. Uh, and then we ask, what is that underlying process? And then we start going into physics, uh, and we start speaking about you know um, geoelectrical uh, potential differences in the atmosphere, and you know, and that's the ultimate description of what's going on. The ultimate description is of the causal mechanisms that we infer from the observational, the observable data. And that's how we come up with the basic theory, a basic, a, 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 a fundamental science of lightning and thunder, um, mm. you know, which is the theory of electricity. Um, and, and I think that that's what we need um, in, in neuroscience or neuropsychology. If we're going to bridge the divide between the psychological and the neurological, between the subjective uh, and the objective perspectives, on the being of a creature, then we need to find a more fundamental language which explains both uh, both sets of phenomena. We mm -hmm. don't we don't want to ask how does the one set of phenomena cause the other set of phenomena because they don't. So what I'm saying uh, in, in essence is that the hard problem is made a lot harder than it has to be uh, if we if we conceptualize it that way. If, if we ask the question how do how does the brain get over the hump from electrochemistry to feeling? Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a question that can't be answered because it's wrongly framed. Um, but if we ask, you know, what is it that produces both the electrochemistry and what explains the behavior of the electrochemistry and the behavior of the feeling, uh, then, we, then we have a mechanistic theory. And, and I, I think that um, the, the prospects of finding such a mechanistic theory are greatly increased by shifting our focus away from mm. these very complicated visual perceptual processes, which, as I've already said, uh, these cortical processes are way down the evolutionary line. Uh, they're much later developments. They're a secondary application um, of uh, what feeling is for and what feeling does, and focus instead on the primary form of feeling in the brain stem, which is, as I've also already said, an extended form of homeostasis, mm. then we say, okay, so we have a fairly good clue uh, as to what the mechanism is that we're looking for. Uh, it's, it's homeostasis or it's some version of homeostasis. And uh, I, I, I think uh, from that uh, starting point, uh, we know, obviously there's a lot more that could be said about, okay, so then how do we do it? How, how does uh, homeostasis mechanistically, how does it explain uh, the behavior uh, of the predictive brain? Uh, and how does it explain uh, the experience of being uh, an, of an, an intentional being with, 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 with goals and, and aims and purposes and so on? Uh, I, I think that from that starting point, it can be done. Um, and my, my own efforts in this area have been have been along those lines, trying to trying to begin to um, sketch what 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 this uh, what this uh, alt, this monist uh, um, mm -hmm. mechanistic uh, um, causal explanatory process might be, whereby uh, we we have the the, the particular physiology uh, of consciousness and the particular phenomenology of it. I'm glad you, you just mentioned monist and us because I was thinking, I mean, we spoke about some of the history of philosophy. We, we spoke about David Chalmers and his 1995 paper. I mean, do you think Descartes, Rene Descartes, when he started this, this question of this mind body problem, when he started with this dualistic approach, do you think that also had a big impact on the way we perceived this problem in the first place? Very much so. Mm. Uh, and, and David Chalmers makes little uh, secret of his admiration uh, for Descartes, <laughs> um, I I I think yeah. I mean, I I I wholly concur with the title of Damasio's famous book, uh, Descartes' Error. No. Uh, it was a horrendous error. 
so so the the philosophy that I find myself much more sympathetic, sympathetic with is 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 that of, of Baruch Spinoza. Mm. Uh, that that I think is a great advance over Descartes. Mm. Um, I'm actually going to chat to Tomasio about in a couple of days, so I'm very look, I'm looking forward to that. But Mark, send him my best wishes. I'll, I'll definitely I, I, do so. I like him very much. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing Descartes' area in quite a bit of detail. Mark, when you're looking at this brainstem, you're looking at this midbrain, you, you're talking about ancient consciousness. I know sometimes, because the main goal of this podcast is for me to provide you, someone who has a an excellent new thought process on this problem, to explain their view, express themselves openly, and to also address any objections people might have to their theory. But when, when you talk about the ancient brain, do you feel that that's giving people a sort of a misconception on what you mean by ancient consciousness? Because I feel like I've, I've, I've read blogs, I've read a couple of things where people think you're taking it too far. I've t- chatted to some scientists about it, some, some philosophers, and they think you're taking it too low. But yet you're explaining exactly why the cortical versions of this are not the same. Do you think that they're mistaking consciousness with intelligence? I do. I do very much so think that, uh, although um, I don't deny uh, that very simple creatures like a bacterium has an intelligence. Yes. Uh, it's obviously in, it's nothing like uh, our intelligence. And I, I, it's it's a it's a perfectly understandable uh, state of affairs that we start with human consciousness. Well, we are human, for, for one thing. Uh, for another thing, the problem of other minds dictates that the only form of consciousness we can ever observe directly is our own. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's 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 not an unreasonable place to start. Uh, it's not it's not hard to understand why we began there. But it's quite a different thing to say that therefore human consciousness is the definitional form, you know, that anything which doesn't uh, conform uh, to our uh, type of consciousness isn't really consciousness. Um, you, you started this podcast by asking me the question, why is there something it is like to be me? That is, uh, of course, Chalmers' definition, building upon Tom Nagel's definition from 1974. Um, it's notoriously difficult to get a neuroscientist, or for that matter, anyone, to agree on a definition of consciousness. But I think if there's one definition that has more or less uh, united us, it is that it is something. It is likeness. You know, it's it is qualia. That's what we mean by consciousness. And so there's nothing uh, uh, there's nothing complicated about that. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't uh, have anything uh, more in common with uh, Descartes thinking uh, cogito ergo sum uh, than it does uh, uh, in common with the, the 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 raw feel of pain. You know, there is something it is like to feel pain. So, when you say I'm I'm going too far, uh, I, 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 philosophically speaking. All I'm saying is I want to start, I want to, I want to define consciousness as, as something it is like to be in that yes. there is something it is like to be in that state. Um, and that's not a controversial definition of consciousness. Yes. Uh, and then I'm saying, well, there is something it is like to be in pre-verbal, non-verbal uh, states uh, of raw affect like pain. I find it very hard to to imagine how anyone could argue against that. Mm. You know, there is something it is like to be to be hungry. There is something it is like to be thirsty. There's, there's something it is like to be in pain. There's something it is like to experience separation distress, which all mammals experience and display. Um, there's something it is like to feel fear. Uh, and, you know, and you don't need to be able to reflect upon uh, the source of your pain. It's mm. a very very great advantage to be able to, but you don't have to have any theory of pain or any explanation of pain or any knowledge of pain as mechanisms, etc., or even just know anything about what caused me to feel this. All you just need to know is I feel it. Mm. That's that is that is uh, I think a, 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 a very 
defendable position that yes. that's what we mean fundamentally by a conscious state. Um, mm. You know, I, I grant, of course, that these higher forms of consciousness add all kinds of bells and whistles. And mm. uh, I, I'm very grateful to be the proud possessor of all of those bells and whistles. And I don't want to forego them, you know, so therefore I'm well aware that they add a hell of a lot mm. more. But I don't think it's the right place to start mm. if you're wanting to understand the basic mechanism whereby something it is likeness uh, appeared uh, on this planet. You know how it, how and why it evolved uh, that that creature started to to, to quote Tom Nagel. He said uh, that something like I, I, I'm paraphrasing, but he said uh, an organism is only conscious. If there is something it is like to be the organism, something mm. it is like for the organism, you know, yeah. that's that's that, that's a compelling definition for me of, of what consciousness is, and uh, and uh, and it makes, I mean, in terms of everything else we do in biology, you know, we take an evolutionary perspective. We we try and understand, you know, wh what this thing, how this thing evolved, why this thing evolved, what does it add. What does it do? That's why once it once it evolves, it gets it gets conserved because it it continues to perform that function, uh, and and that function uh, 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 bestows such enormous additional uh, survival uh, potential uh, that that it 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 just hangs around. Now um, you got to look at the arguments. Uh, so I've just given you in principle arguments about why I think that's a fine place to start. It's, in fact, to me, the obvious place to start, yes. uh, although I can understand uh, why we started in another place. Uh, I think that it was a mistake in retrospect, and now we can correct that mistake and start in a better place. But it's not just a matter of principles. You know, it's a matter, it's also an empirical matter. Yes. When you start um, looking scientifically at what is the minimal um, architecture for for consciousness um you you know you and and you know you 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 can start with human beings even uh, you know if you if you produce not deliberately uh, so let me rather say uh, if it so happens uh, that you suffer a lesion um, in the reticular activating system that lesion can be as small as two millimeters cubed. In other words, the size of a match head. Uh, if it's in the parabrachial complex, the right part of the parabrachial complex, that will produce a coma. In, in any and in every human being, uh, you, uh, the, the, the Fisher's, uh, uh, Fisher's analysis of all of the scans um, of stroke uh, trying to identify what is the small, what is the common denominator, what area is always lesioned uh, in patients in coma. Uh, it, it's the it's it's a, it's a small uh, two, cub two cubic millimeter area of the parabrachial complex. So that wipes out what, something. It is likeness reliably. Mm. You know, I mean, you can. You, my prediction is lesion that area, the animal will go into a coma. Bingo! It always happens. The mm. prediction is confirmed each and every time. Now, uh, by contrast, uh, what about the cerebral cortex? Uh, the cerebral cortex, in fact, since the 1880s, uh, has been removed in experimental animals with gay abandon. Um, and uh, even in the 1880s, it was already observed that uh, goats, for example, did it in dogs. But the dogs didn't go into a coma. They, they just, they became what goats described as idiotish. In other words, they became stupid. They, they, lost their, they lost their knowledge, their understanding of the world. Um, but they still behaved, uh, you know, purposively. Uh, they, they, mm. they, they behave, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you about goats, but since then, for decades, you know, a decortication has been performed on, on innumerable mammal species. And the if it's done neonatally, you know, the, 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 the observation is always the same, you know, that they, they play, uh, they show fear, uh, they get enraged uh, in situationally appropriate uh, 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 ways, um, they copulate, 
with each other. Uh, they rear little little pups to maturity. I mean, not perfectly, but they do. Mm. They play. They hang from bars. They swing around. You know, they they in fact, Jak Panksepp uh, used to um, he 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 he, he performed a little um, sort of experiment. It's not really an experiment, but each of his new cohort of graduate students, uh, he would show them two groups of rats uh, in two different cages. Uh, the one group had been decorticated uh, and the other group had had a sham decortication. In other words, they had the little bandage on their heads, but, <sighs> but they, they hadn't had the operation. And he asked them, which of these two groups uh, has no cortex? And, and every year he ha had the same result, you know, that the students identified the animals that were, were, were intact as being the decorticate ones. Mm. And he said, why? And they said, because the other ones are more lively. In other words, in reality, the decorticate uh, uh, rodents are more lively. They're more emotionally expressive. That's because they don't have the cortical modulation um, of their... But now we're talking about, about rodents and, and dogs and whatnot. Uh, what about human beings? Uh, if the cortex was the seat of consciousness, then there's an easy prediction, which is that you know, uh, uh, just we don't do neonatal decortication in human beings, but sadly there are neonates who are born with no cortex. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is a condition known as hydranencephaly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prediction would be, if the cortex was the seat of consciousness, that these kids should be in a coma. They got no cortex. Um, at the very least, they should be in a, in a persistent vegetative state. Mm -hmm. But that's not what you observe. They are not vegetative. You know, veg the vegetative state is also called um, non-responsive wakefulness. Non-responsive wakefulness. These kids are utterly responsive. Uh, they and, and just as I described for the for the for the animal studies, uh, they are responsive. Uh, they are emotionally responsive in situationally appropriate ways. In other words, you tickle the child, uh, she laughs. Um, you frustrate the child, she arches her back and complains. Uh, you give the child a fright and she startles. Uh, and, and they show a behavioral initiative. They, they, they approach things that they like and they avoid things that they don't like. Um, you know, anybody who, has, anybody who has studied these children seriously, um, you know, they, they, they come to this conclusion. Mm. Um, people, who, philosophers, um, you know, uh, who are all skeptical about this, I really invite them to just interact with these kids. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, yeah. it's very, very difficult to sustain the argument. So, so um, I was saying it's, it's very hard to sustain the argument that these kids are not conscious if you actually interact with them. But, um, you know, it is ultimately because of the problem of other minds, it's ultimately a matter of, uh, of inference. Um, and what my colleagues say, I mean, uh, when I say colleagues here, I'm not only referring to philosophers, there are many neuroscientists who, who are very skeptical uh, about uh, the claim. Uh, the claim by, uh, I, 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 I hasten to add, not only me, uh, you know, a, a good many of us who actually have interacted with these kids find it very hard to believe that they're not conscious. They are feeling creatures who behave in every way like feeling creatures. The, the argument that is made against this is we cannot know for sure that they are not uh, just reflexes. Yes. Well, remember what I said about reflexes at the beginning of our discussion. You know, in reflexes, there's an entirely predictable response. Uh, there's no variation. Uh, there's no trial and error. There's no intentionality. Uh, you know, th this is not what you see in these kids. It's also not what you see in the decorticate animals. So uh, it's, it's it, you know, anyone who knows anything about how the reflexes of the nervous system work, yeah. know that what you see here ain't reflexes um, or instincts. You know, they are not, they are not uh, reducible. I mean, they are dominated by instincts. That's true. These kids are, you know, they, they are not like you and me, but they show they show goal-directed, intentional, uh, 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 purposive, and voluntary behavior. And if you read the, the, the descriptions by the pediatric neurologists who've studied these kids and the neuroscientists who've studied these kids, 
you see, you know, the, the, the detailed evidence for that. But uh, you can't be sure, say my colleagues. So um, let me just hasten to add, you can't be sure that your pet dog is conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't mm -hmm. be sure that your pet cat is conscious. You, you can't be sure that anyone other than you yourself are conscious. And then the argument is given, well, reportability gets us out of that problem. You know, uh, uh, it's true that our dogs and cats uh, can't report their conscious state. So there's room for skepticism there. You know, but Tevin and I do and Mark Solms can say there's something it is like to be me. Let me tell you what I'm experiencing right now. I'm experiencing X, Y and Z. I don't know why that's considered such wonderful evidence, mm -hmm. you know, because a, a, ro a robot can do that. Exactly. A robot can exactly. report its states. You know, you can write a very simple program. Just say, you know, whenever you're in this, that or the other mode, say, I'm experiencing it. But how do you know it really is experiencing it? Mm -hmm. So I don't think reportability uh, is, is, I mean, by the way, on the reportability thing, we, we, we're saying not only that our dogs and cats aren't conscious, we're saying that our pre-verbal kids aren't conscious, humans, you know. Exactly. So we need better, we need, a, we need better ways of, of, of deciding the question. Uh, w w when you go on the internet and you're trying to access something and it wants to know that you're not a robot, it doesn't say, please tell me, please declare you're not a robot. You know, it, it, it gives you an, an ambiguous situation, a problem, and, and you have to navigate some uncertainty there and solve the problem. Yes. Um, you know, why, 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 why is that the case? What, if, if, if declaring your states, you know, was, 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 was such a wonderful method for determining uh, yes, because that's me, that does seem to be the the case. Sorry, did you want to add to that, Mark? Before I well, go? sadly, I have a lot to add to it. So let me rather let you get a word in edgeways, <laughs> and then I'll carry on. <laughs> no, you can continue. As much, I'm enjoying listening, so well, it's fine. So, so what I do, uh, what I say to my colleagues is, okay, well, let's take, you know, you you, you guys don't claim that the whole of cortex is the seat of consciousness. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the 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 general view is, you know, that there's that there's all this information processing going on there, which is then accessed uh, by uh, some sort of overarching um, global workspace or, 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 or something of the kind. And where is this thing located? Well, the standard argument is prefrontal cortex. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the other uh, well-known or, or, or widely held position, which is, I think, probably a better one, uh, is that it's insular cortex. Why I say better? Because insular cortex has to do with feelings, which I've already told you is the basic, in my view, form of consciousness. Uh, but uh, if the prefrontal cortex were, the, and many people say this, I mean, my dear colleague and friend, Joe Ledoux, says that, that all of this stuff, you know, he's an expert on subcortical uh, 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 affective uh, circuitry, specifically Fear circuitry uh, and and specifically the amygdala, and he says all of that stuff going on in the amygdala is unconscious mm. um, until mm. it is uh, until it is read out by the cortex. Literally, he uses the word label. You know, in other words, until you use until you can have this concept, I am feeling fear. You're not feeling fear. Uh, so so what happens if you remove? Again, we don't do it experimentally, but it happens in nature that there are patients with no prefrontal cortex. In fact, I'll tell you, it's not unusual to have patients with large prefrontal cortical lesions. On Joe Ledoux's view, they should be less affective. There should be less emotional consciousness. But there's more. I mean, since, since um, Phineas Gage, we've known, mm. frontal patients have too much emotion. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I have a patient, uh, case W, who has no prefrontal cortex whatsoever. Uh, and he, not only is he like all such patients, all frontal patients, you know, he's a hyper emotional. Um, he's he's be very overwhelmed by his feelings. Not only that, but you know, he, he answers questions that I put to him about what is it like to be you? I ask mm -hmm. him to imagine a scene in his mind, uh, which had to do with, uh, I said, imagine you have two dogs and one chicken. Can, do, can you picture them? He says, yes. I said, now tell me, can you count their legs and tell me what the total number of legs are? And the, the answer, of course, is 10, two dogs and one chicken. 
So to my great disappointment, because I was trying to prove he's, he's, there's somebody home, you know, he's there with mental imagery and he can, <laughs> and he can experience it. He, to my great disappointment, he said eight. The oh, answer yeah. was eight. I said eight. He said, yes, the dogs ate the chicken. <laughs> So, you know, no prefrontal cortex, there's a sentient being there. Uh, and Damasio reported a case, uh, patient B, uh, who had absolutely no insula cortex. Mm. Uh, and the same thing, he, 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 Damasio interviewed him about, you know, and the patient keeps on referring to me and I, and I, yes, of course I have a mind, and yes, I'm experiencing this. And, and Damasio's patient also had heightened affective feelings, not a reduction in affect, which is what Bud Craig's theory but craig is the guy who said you know the insula is the is the is the uh, seat of the fundamental form of mm. consciousness feeling well uh, demasia showed that with no insular cortex you still have feeling uh, i showed with no prefrontal cortex you still have feeling and you have sentient being reportable conscious states so then my colleagues say well it's due to the remaining cortex so you see you can't win because they say uh, the case with no cortex, they can't declare their state, so therefore we don't know. So I say, okay, well, let's take this with no prefrontal cortex. They say, well, maybe it's posterior cortex. Take one with no posterior cortex. Well, maybe it's anterior cortex. So that's now, now I, I'm near the end of my argument, which is that, so let's look at other methods other than lesion methods. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if the feelings are actually generated in the subcortical structures, I mean, literally in, in other words, they're not being read out by cortex uh, because everybody knows, of course, these affective mechanisms are subcortical, yes. but the idea is they're not conscious until they read out by cortex. So uh, if that were the case, then if you, if you take, for example, uh, positron emission tomographic images of, of human beings who are in intense affective states, which they can report, so they say, I am feeling really sad. You know? I am feeling absolutely uh, joyous. Uh, I am feeling trepidatiously fearful, or I am feeling really angry. Mm. Each of those mm. four states, uh, and I'm not just saying I am feeling, I mean, people who, who really are in the grip of intense affects, if you scan them with PET imaging, uh, what is the prediction? Uh, if, it, if, if, it's, if, it's the, if it's the brain stem, and the and this uh, limbic circuitry arising from it uh, that is responsible for those affects, then that's where you should see the highest rate of metabolic activity. That's that's what we that that seems to be an acceptable method for everything else in neuroscience. So you know, so here too, yeah. we're yeah. saying, well, if the if the greatest um, if the if the hot spots are in the brainstem. Uh, then that's where the state is being generated. And that's exactly what you find. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you image people in intense affective states, you see intense arousal of brain, upper brain stem structures and the circuits, the limbic circuitry, but not cortex. You know? Now, what about another method? Uh, so, so in other words, the prediction is confirmed. Yes. Now, what about another method? Deep brain stimulation. Uh, the the prediction is if the if the affects are generated in the brain stem, you know, then if you generate if you stimulate those structures that you are saying are generating the affects, in other words, reticular activating system, mm -hmm. the prediction is you will stimulate, you will generate artificially an intense affect, and uh, and conversely, you won't if you stimulate cortex, and that's what happens. You know, you stimulate cortex, you get just about no affects. And when you do, it's they really thoughts. They're not affects. They're kind of like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm remembering this time that I was a bit down. You know, but you stimulate this. When I speak about a bit down, stimulate substantial nigra, you produce within five seconds depression, clinical depression, like mm -hmm. suicidal mm -hmm. depression. Um, you know, and, and you switch off the stimulator. 90 seconds later, the person is out of the depression. Uh, and I'm talking about reticular activating system, but it's not only reticular activating system, it's periaqueductal gray. Mm -hmm. Periaqueductal mm -hmm. gray, which is, which is in the midbrain, uh, you, there's a greater variety of affects generated by stimulating the periaqueductal gray than any other brain structure. 
and a greater intensity of affect. Um, so that's a third method. So the lesion method, you know, you add it to the functional imaging method, you add it to the, to the deep brain stimulation method, then there's also pharmacological uh, probes. You know, if you, it's no accident that the major psychiatric drugs, uh, the, 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 the psychopharmacological agents that form the mainstay of, of, of clinical practice these days, uh, they are like, like antidepressants, SSRIs, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are mm -hmm. they doing? They are increasing serotonin. Where is serotonin sourced? It's, 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 it's sourced in the reticular activating system, uh, in the RAFE nuclei. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where, mm -hmm. is, uh, where is dopamine? You know, antipsychotics block dopamine. Where is that sourced? Apart from the substantia nigra, which I mentioned earlier, the type that's important for psychosis is sourced in the ventral tegmental area. Which is part of the reticular activating system. Mm. Uh, uh, noradrenaline is sourced in the locus ceruleus complex. You know, you 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 modulate noradrenaline or you 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 block noradrenaline to block anxiety. So if these nuclei, you know, are are the targets or, or at least the 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 they're the 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 source cells of the neurons, the the, the cell bodies of the neurons that, that are targeted by all of these psychopharmacological agents, they, they're all in the reticular activating system. This tells us something. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so, so I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm speaking so much, Devin, let me just come back to my, to my main argument, which is that it's not, when people say Mark Solms is going too far to say, well, you know, these brainstem structures and simple affects um, are, are, are the model example of consciousness. I told you in principle why I think affects are the right model example. And then I said, and empirically, you know, the, the, you, you look at uh, the, all of the evidence, all of the evidence speaks to, speaks for the conclusion that actually affects are generated there. Where in the part of the brain that we've known since 1949 is the, is the basic prerequisite for all other forms of consciousness. Mm. Uh, the mm. only problem is in, in when Magoon and Maruzzi discovered that, and nobody disputes it, that it is prerequisite. You can't have a conscious cortex unless it's activated by the reticular activating system. Yes. But when they yes. discovered that, they said, yes, but the reticular activating system produces, around, produces what did they call it? The level of consciousness. Yes. Uh, a quantitative sort of like volume of consciousness, but it hasn't got any phenomenal content. And that's what I've just shown you isn't true. You know, it has phenomenal content. The content I grant you is not cognitive, but it is affective. There's, a, there's something it is like to be in those states that I've just described. Uh, therefore, uh, they, are, they are qualitative states. They're not just quantitative states. Uh, uh, and they have content. The content is, you know, the, 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 the feeling of pain versus the feeling of hunger versus the feeling of sleepiness. Those, that's, that's the content. That's what those states are about. Yeah. So if, if the yeah. upper brain stem was, was only about some quantitative dimension, the level of consciousness, it would only be of interest to a, a, an anesthetists. Yes. But well, okay. psychiatrists are tinkering with those, with those circuits. So, yeah, so, in, in, yeah, in so essence, there you have it. In essence, the, you've, I mean, we've used this clinical differentiation between contents of consciousness versus the level of consciousness, but you're clearly showing that in essence, they're both very much linked. I mean, they're they're one and the same in a sense. Where, 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 whether your whether your level of consciousness is slightly lower in terms of let's say a GCS scale, doesn't necessarily mean that the person doesn't have effective qualitative experiences. Exactly. So we clarify. Uh, I, I find it a very it's a totally artificial distinction. There, yeah. there is no such thing as I mean, how can you? How can you have blank consciousness? Mm. You know, it's what, what is such a what is a blank consciousness? Uh, so you know, you can't be conscious without being conscious of something. I mean, we've known that since Brentano. You know, yeah. it, uh, it, it's uh, so I, I think that that distinction uh, uh, drawn by Magoon and Maruzzi uh, all those decades ago was because they were so co completely flabbergasted by the finding, which remember, they weren't in any way expecting uh, that if you disconnect the cat cortex from the cat reticular activating system, 
there is no more conscious cat. You know, yeah. uh, the, 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 the cortical consciousness uh, cannot just, just disappears uh, without, without particular uh, arousal. And so it was a way, because everybody knew that the cortex was the seat of consciousness, they had to explain this somehow. And so they came up with this totally artificial distinction between um, this, this waking state, uh, with, which is contentless, um, and, you know, and then the phenomenal yeah. uh, qualities and, and contents of, uh, that, that the cortex had. I mean, but that's what I like about your book as well, is that you, you do do that. You show different methods of how you can prove this and predict what your theory claims. Yeah, well, because ideally that's what we want in a scientific theory of, of anything. You want, so you want different ways of proving the same thing, which is what you've basically shown in many ways. What I find very fascinating, Mark, is that other neuroscientists, like let's say, for example, Michael Graziano, he also pays a lot of attention to the tectum, optic tectum, which, which we call the superior colliculus. But then they draw completely different conclusions They're regarding, I mean, he uses this as the attention schema theory, where we're building models of attention, but we're not really um, aware in the sense that we have qualia. We rather introspectively conclude that we have this. So I still find it quite fascinating that some people are using similar brain regions and brain structures and drawing different conclusions. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, but 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 let me clarify there. Um, I am not, uh, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Mm. Uh, the, the, the optic tectum or, 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 or superior colliculi, um, they, they are, uh, they are receiving um, information from the uh, sensory end organs, um, sensory motor end organs. Um, but that doesn't mean that that information is conscious. Mm. Um, I mean, the famous example is blind sight. Uh, with, with, with the cortically blind cases, who nevertheless can navigate an obstacle course, uh, they are completely unaware that they're seeing anything, and yet they can avoid things that are in their way. And the 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 the, the most widely accepted explanation for that is it's because the 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 optic tectum is 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 processing the information unconsciously. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. It's unconscious. Um, and 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 it, it also receives auditory information and somatosensory information and so on. Um, and uh, the so these kids, for example, the the the, the high brain encephalic kids, uh, I the the reason they're able to respond to their environments is because they're receiving information about the environment from their sensory uh, epithelium, and uh, but it is unconscious. Mm -hmm. Then they, it evokes a feeling in them. Uh, all they know, all they experience on the evidence available to me, it leads me to the conclusion that they, I, I don't think I can claim that they experience anything more than just a feeling. They don't have to know what the feeling is about, where it came from, what made me feel this, what is the thing out there in the world. It, 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 it's not necessary. So I'm saying, because remember the, the, the superior colliculi, well, well the, the, the whole of the tectum, mm -hmm. so the superior and inferior colliculi, the whole of the tectum uh, is, is in absolutely adjacent to the periaqueductal gray. Yes. So all of the, well, not smell, but all of the other senses of projecting uh, unconscious uh, mm -hmm. visual, auditory, somatosensory information to the to the tectum, uh, and that in turn uh, is is coupled with uh, all of the homeostatic mechanisms that we mentioned at the beginning of our discussion. All of the homeostatic mechanisms, the affect mechanisms, uh, including the emotions, uh, because they are bodily affects and their emotional affects, they all send uh, their residual error signals to the periaqueductal gray immediately adjacent to the tectum. So, uh, so it's, it's something like, it's something like, you know, um, where things, where things stand now in the outside world, which is not consciously registered, uh, and where things stand now uh, in, uh, from the, from the 
endogenous perspective of the organism. Uh, and, and then uh, the feeling is about those things, but the feeling is all that the, that the, that the creature experiences. You then need higher uh, structures. Uh, mm. The thalamocortical structures make it possible for that feeling to be applied to a stabilized rep because the tectum is just like a sort of salience map. It's an attentional, mm. I agree with that description of it. Mm. Uh, but the cortex has these stabilized, detailed mappings. Uh, of. Uh, it's, it's not only that they're detailed mappings of the outside world, mm. filtered through a lifetime of experience of it, because cortex is memory, memory space, uh, but it's also that it can be held in mind in working memory. So you can actually, you know, okay, I feel like this about that. So what am I going to do about it? You know, that's, that's what the cortical consciousness adds. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and perhaps even more important than that is that you can then manipulate those representations um, virtually. In mm -hmm. other words, you, can, you don't only have to feel your way through the world here and now by trial and error, uh, bearing in mind that trial and error involves errors. Which are which are costly. Uh, mm. So so thinking uh, where you have virtual representations of if I were to do that, what would happen? And if I were to do the other thing, what would happen then? And feeling you feel your way through these virtual scenarios. All of this is what cortex adds. Um, and uh, I, I keep on saying I'm very grateful to have that. And I recognize that that is a, a, a way more complex form of consciousness than the elementary form. But for all the reasons I've already said, I think that the elementary form, nevertheless, is the right place to start. And the elementary form, nevertheless, qualifies as consciousness defined as there being something it is like to have it. What, what I really like is that at some point, I mean, when you're talking about homeostasis, you're talking about how we're trying to figure this out and quantify a lot of these qualitative experiences. You, the, your work then somehow links with a lot of Carl Friston's work. And I mean, Carl Friston is definitely one of the like most, I mean, he's the most cited neuroscientist on the planet, I think. Um, and your work seems to coincide quite well. Do you want to touch on that? Because I find that very intriguing, the way you guys have linked up. I read the paper that you guys did together as well. And I even used it part of my dissertation that you were very generous to help me with. Uh, but yeah, let's touch on that a bit. So um, I said earlier that uh, I'm a dual aspect monist. In other words, I think we have two different ways of observing uh, the, 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 the mental instrument. Um, you can look at it from the outside as, as an organ. Uh, you can look at it from the inside as, as, a, as a phenomenal state of mind. Uh, but these two things are uh, reducible to one causal mechanism. Uh, and that is something you infer from the data of, of, uh, of observation. Uh, and, and I said that um, if, you, if you accept that the elementary form of consciousness is feeling uh, and that feeling uh, is an extended form of homeostasis, then you have a rather simple mechanism. Uh, you, know, you, you, have a, you have a good place, to, a tractable place to start mm -hmm. uh, because homeostasis is not difficult to understand. And so Carl Friston published a paper in 2013 um, in one of the journals of the Royal Society. It's mm -hmm. called Royal Society Interface. And the paper was titled Life as We Know It, um, and in, which is a wonderful title. Yeah. And, and in that uh, paper, he basically explicated uh, in, in, in ordinary uh, you know, um, physical uh, uh, terms, how, uh, by which I mean, by which I mean, you know, physical mechanics. Uh, mm -hmm. how, 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 does, how does homeostasis work? Um, and so I said to him, on, upon reading that paper, you know, that the, the mechanism of, of homeostasis, which you so beautifully uh, uh, you know, reduced to equations in, in, uh, in that paper, uh, if, if consciousness uh, is an extended form of homeostasis. And by the way, all those brainstem nuclei are, not all of them, but I mean, the, the, the fundamental homeostats of the, of the human body are, 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 you know, sort of like hypothalamus and, and midbrain. 
And uh, I said, you know, it, it should be possible to extend uh, then these, these mechanistic accounts that you provide of homeostasis account of feeling. So that's what the paper that I wrote with him was about. Um, so that's background uh, to move a little bit further forward. So as everyone knows, so I'm not going to uh, go into this uh, chapter in verse. Uh, Friston has, has uh, uh, the, the, the flag that he's tied to his mast is the free energy principle, uh, which, is, which is basically um, a, 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 a statement of uh, the, the, that self-organizing systems, um, systems which persist, which continue to exist, uh, they have to do something to continue to exist. Um, that this is how, this is what distinguishes. I'm not saying all self-organizing systems are living systems, but what what but all living systems are self-organizing systems. And what distinguishes living systems from non-living ones is that they oppose the second law of thermodynamics. In other words, they don't just dissipate. They have they have they have preferred states, uh, and they work to stay in those states, and that's how they stay alive. You know, in the end, the second law wins. Uh, we don't stay alive forever. But, you know, the whole, the essential feature of living systems is that they are acting uh, on their environments in such a way as to increase their chances of carrying on existing as systems. So the free energy principle is just a formalist, a formal understanding of the mechanisms whereby that works, how self-organizing systems resist entropy. Uh, and by the way, when I said not all self-organizing systems are living systems, that's a good thing because living systems evolve from non-living systems. You know? So the fact that we can have a physics that explains the, this basic type of system, uh, which then became the living system, uh, is a necessary thing. You know, We have to be able to explain life in terms of things that were around before life came uh, into mm. existence. And by the way, the same applies to consciousness. We must be able to, the conscious, life evolved long before consciousness evolved. So, you know, there must be something, it, it, must have, it must have been constructed out of ingredients that were already there. And I'm saying self-organizing systems uh, provide us with those ingredients. So the free energy principle uh, explains that how self-organizing, it formalizes the mechanisms whereby self-organizing systems, in order to continue to exist, they have to minimize their free energy, which is basically the same thing as to say they have to have a model of the world, because uh, how else can you act in that world to, to, to uh, maximize your chances of surviving? So it's a predictive model. It's a model that if I were to do that in the world, this would be the sensory consequences. That's how I maintain homeostasis. So if my sensory state is I'm moving out of my homeostatic bounds, I'm getting too hot, uh, or I'm getting too thirsty, uh, then I must do that. I must get out of the kitchen or I must drink some water. You know, that will bring me back into my viable bounds. So that's the basic. And, and the free energy principle says to the extent that what you predicted will happen in consequence of your actions, to the extent that it does not happen, that's called surprisal. Uh, average surprisal basically is free energy. In other words, you must be using your energy, you must bind your energy into actions which lead to the outcomes that are, you require in order to survive. Free energy, in other words, energy that is not being efficiently used, uh, must therefore be minimized. In other words, the gap between you, what, you, what you expect to flow from your actions and what actually flows from your actions uh, that gap must be minimized. So that's uh, the whole of Friston's work basically just boils down to that. I mean, I, I don't want to diminish it. It's absolute genius, you know. Uh, but that principle uh, explains uh, homeostasis uh, and it explains the goal-directed behaviors, the allostatic um, uh, imperative, you know, in order to maintain within my homeostatic, remain within my homeostatic bounds, I have to do things in the outside world and I have to have a good understanding of how the outside world works uh, in order for me to know what things to do. And while I'm busy learning that, uh, I make lots of mistakes uh, and I slowly improve my predictive model uh, in order to minimize those mistakes. That's what the whole of cognition is for. And what is cognition therefore doing? Uh, it, is, it is serving the, 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 
free energy principle. In other words, it's minimizing uh, homeostatic errors. It means it is, it, in other words, it is, it is reversing negative affects and turning them into positive affects. Um, that's, so affect, which is the demand for mental work, is a demand for predictive work. Uh, and the, the predictive work is what our cognition is all about. So uh, I've, I've given you a very uh, broad brushstroke sketch there, yeah. but that's what we worked out together in that, in that first paper that we wrote together, uh, which I then expanded in, into my book. It's showing that, you know, I said, I don't believe that we've solved the hard problem, but I believe we've given a good clue as to which direction we should be going in. That is a monistic account. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tractable, quantifiable, uh, statistical, mechanical account of the, 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 the machinery of the mind and brain, which is an information processing machinery in the service of minimizing free energy in order to maintain uh, the organisms within their viable bounds so that they can survive. Uh, that's it. So, so Mark, I mean, like you, you're, you're taking a physicalist, monist account of this. What are your thoughts on then other theories of consciousness in terms of philosophical theories? Let's take panpsychism, for example, or idealism. What are your thoughts on those types of theories? I think panpsychism is a little easier to deal with uh, than idealism. Mm. Uh, pan, uh, it's um, so. Um, let's start with the problem of other minds, which is the big problem when it comes to consciousness science. It really is uh, the, 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 because conscious states just are subjective states. You can only ever know your own. Mm -hmm. um, so we start there. Uh, this 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 might be considered a really simplistic argument against panpsychism, but it's the one that I start with. I can't know whether computers are conscious and tables are conscious and walls are conscious and rocks are conscious. You know, um, I, I, I do know I'm conscious. Um, so now, am I conscious of everything that's going on inside of me? No, I'm only conscious of things that are going inside of my brain. My brain, uh, the brain states are only uh, the, the, the conscious of other bodily states to the extent that those other bodily organs are represented in the brain. So, so the brain, and this, this is not just a, a, a commonsensical argument, it's an empirically demonstrable fact. You never lose consciousness by removing any part of the body other than removing the brain. If, if you lose consciousness by removing the heart, it's because the heart is no longer perfusing the brain, you know, et cetera. So it's like clearly the case that consciousness is in the brain. And so, you know, all of the other bodily processes are not conscious. Uh, I, 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 empirically, I can tell you that in my own case, you know, I, 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 there's the only way I get to know about, and there's a hell of a lot of processes which never become conscious, mm. like blood pressure regulation, for example. You know, it's going on all the time. Uh, thank God for that. But uh, you know, there's no conscious. Why is there no consciousness involved in that? By the way, it's because it's entirely predictable. You can leave that to reflexes. You know, there's 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 no novel situations there that you have to feel your way through. Um, so panpsychism, if you take if you take as your starting point, well, you know, the only thing I can know empirically uh, is is what I'm conscious of. Well, I know even in my own case, there's a hell of a lot going on within the 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 the, the, the uh, outer surface of this thing called Mark Solms that Mark Solms is not conscious of. Mm. So you could start then saying, well, of course, it is possible that your muscles are conscious of themselves and they're not reporting it to you. And then, you know, th then you should start getting into into never, never land because, yeah, that's possible. I mean, anything's possible. It's possible, yeah. you know, that, you know, that, that, that pigs can fly, but I've never seen one, mm. you know. And um, so, you know, th that's my argument against panpsychism. Now I'll take, a, a, that's a very simplistic argument because it's, and I start with that one because it's an empirical one. It's the only empirical one because you have to start in your own case. Even within the brain, Tevin, there's a hell of a lot of brain activity, brain structures, which the activity of which we never become conscious of. Mm. You know, so, so consciousness seems to be something quite special, limited to very particular kinds of structures. Um, and so 
you know, th then I, that's another uh, argument, another way of, of, of tackling the problem uh, of panpsychism is you say, well, let's look at the mechanism, what these parts of the brain that we know are generating conscious states, like these homeostatic brain stem mechanisms, let's look at what, you know, what they're doing. There's a very particular kind of uh, functionality there, a very specific mechanism, which is not, you know, you don't find it in every thing. There are many things uh, which exist which are not displaying active inference. In other words, they're not, they're not trying to model their environments uh, in, order to, in order to persist. Um, and you know, if that is the mechanism of the one and only knowable form of consciousness, which is ours, you know, we, we know that uh, the, the, the brainstem mechanisms that generate our consciousness, they seem to be doing this kind of thing. We can then look to every other creature that has similar mechanisms, which by the way is all vertebrates, and we can make testable predictions. We can say, I predict if I stimulate dorsal periaqueductal gray in a zebrafish, you know, uh, it, it won't like it. Uh, it will avoid the stimulus. If I stimulate the, the ventral periaqueductal gray in a zebrafish, it will like it and it will approach the stimulus and the prediction is confirmed. So, you know, that, that's, that's uh, and that happens every time in every creature that has the same architecture as us that, that we know generates affective basic feeling states in us. Uh, all the evidence suggests that they're doing the same thing in these other creatures and also that they can make choices. You know, that the behavior of the animals is consistent with our understanding. And then there are other creatures which don't have the same um, architecture like cephalopods and insects and so on, uh, they, I'm less sure that they're conscious. Uh, you know, I'm not saying they're not, I'm just less sure. And I, I, I use the criterion of, well, can they make choices? Uh, can they feel their way through a novel situation and survive it? And they can. So, you know, well, possibly they're conscious too. Um, but there are many creatures, simple, simpler creatures like bacteria, whose behavior is completely predictable. There's, you see no new ideas coming from a bacterium. You know, the only way that they, that they advance is, is uh, through over generations, through, through natural selection. Uh, it, you, there's, 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 no, there's no new problem solving. Um, you know. So I'm saying that even in living things, Tevin, it, starting with myself, there are lots of my own bodily processes that I know from my own case are not conscious. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know which parts are generative of consciousness. Um, I, I know what those do, roughly speaking. I know what their functionality is. Um, when I test in other animals, um, uh, the prediction arising from the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, inference that those structures and that mechanism is what gives rise to uh, to feelings the predictions are always confirmed mm. uh, where mm. those are not present in living creatures uh, that, that, that those structures and those functions uh, the prediction again uh, is always confirmed that they don't show the functionality that that, that that seems to underpin consciousness in us then you know that's so so um, compelling and then, you know, to go from that to non-living things, I mean, to claim that non-living things are conscious, it's you're just outside of the, the, not only the bounds of testability, you're outside of the bounds of reasonableness. It's just like, why would you say that? And, um, you know, starting from the observables, that, that's where, that's the conclusion you just have to uh, arrive at. If you start from first principles and you say, well, it's possible, that there's something it is like to be anything, mm. then, well, yeah, it's possible. Uh, but anything's possible. Uh, I don't see any reason why one would hold that view unless one starts from the assumption that consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe. Mm. And that's, which I, and that's, I have to say is not, not, not different from the idea of God. You yeah. know, that, that at the time of the Big Bang, there was a consciousness. Maybe, but that's outside of science, you know, to, to, to those kinds of claims. That, if you think about it, that's something that people like Julia Tononi and Christoph Koch have done, fundamentally taking 
consciousness as phi, they can't see it as phi, as fundamental. And doing a lot yeah, of- Yeah, but I think they, they did it in a different way. Um, so, so like, let's take Tononi's case, as you've just said, uh, the, the, the idea that consciousness can be, um, can be, uh, can be objectified um, as, uh, as a quantity uh, of, of integrated information processing. Um, if you hold that theory, uh, then it leads you down some, some rabbit holes that you then have to go down. You know, because if you say, well, okay, the amount of integration in the information processing is what determines the degree of consciousness, uh, then you have to say, well, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, as long as there's any amount of information processing, there must be some degree of consciousness. And conversely, you have to say anything that has the requisite, you know, number uh, must be conscious. Therefore, any a, a highly integrated information processing system like the internet, you know, mm. my theory, me, if I'm Tononi, my theory requires me to say, yep, the internet's conscious. Yes. Um, so and, he and doesn't start from first principles. It's fundamentally information at this point, which is how a lot of people are seeing it. Then in essence, everything has a level of, of fire. Yes, everything has... Yeah. That, you know what's 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 a curious little historical fact is that Chalmers. You know, I'll tell you something else, which is another curious fact. Many people who bang on about the hard problem of consciousness have never never read Chalmers's paper. You know, if you actually read Chalmers's paper, the the the, 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 the there's this thing that I'm going to tell you now. There's another thing which I'll tell you as an aside. At the end of the paper. Chalmers says the hard problem is hard, but there's no reason to believe that it will forever remain insoluble. Mm -hmm. And he then, you know, so he's saying it is soluble. Uh, and, uh, and, and he even goes so far as to then present a, 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 a possible solution. And this is the thing I was going to say. His possible solution is that all information uh, has a subjective aspect, uh, and that is consciousness. Uh, and it has an objective aspect, which is this mechanistic thing that we see, you know, it depends what kind of substrate you're using, but like our computers, there they are, they're processing information. But the being of the computer says Chalmers, you know, uh, because it's an information processing device, uh, that there is some small amount of consciousness associated with it, because the, this, the, the internal aspect of information is consciousness. Therefore, because information processing has been going on since forever, uh, consciousness has been around since forever, and it's a fundamental property of the universe. So I don't want to lose sight of the aside I've made there. Please note, Chalmers says the hard problem can be solved. He said it himself in 1995. So all these people who revere this problem as being completely insoluble, uh, that, that it's a metaphysical problem which can never be solved by physical science, that's not what Chalmers said. But he then proposes his own theory, which is a panpsychist theory, uh, which is, well, it's something approaching a panpsychist theory. He doesn't say everything is conscious. He says uh, all information uh, is conscious, um, which, is a, which is a reasonable place to start because uh, what we know about the brain and the mind, what they have in common is that they're processing information, you know, and uh, not everything in the universe is processing information. So, you know, that's why it approaches or heads in the direction of, but now here's the rub for me. Um, if you read, so, so information in Shannon's sense, uh, which is the sense in which Chalmers uses the word, he actually says so in that paper. Um, so Shannon's paper, which brought information into, the, the concept of information into, into physics, into you know, the, the idea that there's a quantifiable thing called information um, and that it has causal property, does stuff uh, you know, in the physical world, that for that uh, uh, realization uh, uh, and conceptualization of it, uh, we have to thank Claude Shannon. And you read his paper, uh, which was published in, if I remember correctly, 1948. It's called, the title says it all. It says, a mathematical theory of communication. 
not a theory of information. It's a theory of communication. Because why? Information has to have a source and a receiver. It's information doesn't just exist. Information, something is only informative to a receiver of that information. So information, and I'm speaking pure Shannon here, information is an answer to a question. You know, it's, is, is the coin toss heads or tails? You know, is it heads? Yes or no? That's one or zero. You know, that is the binary digit. That is the bit. That is the quant how we quantify information. So how many questions I have to ask determines how much information uh, I receive from, uh, from my interaction with my, with my environment. So this information exchange is a question asking and answering exercise. And the crucial point is that the information is subjective. It's received by me uh, who asked the question. The, 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 the system doesn't con a, a, a system doesn't contain a, an objective amount of information. It depends on what question you're asking of the system. So you know so the, the very same I mean if for example, there's a bag of, of balls um, and uh, we you and I both know that there are yellow, red and blue ones in there uh, and we know that there are 30 balls. Uh, I know that 10 of them are red. You don't know that. Uh, that that bag contains more information for you than it does for me. You know, so it depends on it depends on how. So information is a measure of of uncertainty. Uh, the 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 more the more unpredictable is the outcome of an event, uh, the more information it carries for the observer of the event, and it and you and I might have more or less prior knowledge, mm -hmm. so it will be more or less predictable or unpredictable to us. So, so the, why this is all so important is that when you speak about information, whether you're Chalmers or you're Tononi, you have to ask yourself the question of, well, who is the recipient of this information? And so you're back to the question of, well, where's the subject? Mm. Where, like in the internet, where's the subject? Oh, the conscious su subject of all of this information processing, it's integrated, you know, for, for what? It's, so it, it's just like a very weird way of thinking about, I think to say that information in and of itself, you know, is, is uh, or, or, or the integration of that information in some objective arm's length sense, you know, is, is the mechanism of consciousness, I think misses the point. So, so my way of thinking about it, which I tried in a very um, brief and rough and ready way a few minutes ago, when I spoke about Carl Friston and my work on this problem, uh, our starting point was well, uh, uh, an inform a, a self-organizing system, uh, which has to predict the behavior of the world, has to ask questions of the world. You know, it, uh, it, is if I were to do this, what would happen? Kind of, if I were to do this, what would happen to my free energy? Is basically the question that every uh, every biological self-organizing system has to constantly ask. So the information processing that gives rise to feeling, in my view, um, is that kind of information. It's not all information. It's inf it's, 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 the, it's, it's, it's the answering of questions by systems uh, that give a damn you know, about that. They need to ask questions and they give a damn about the answers. Um, that, that is, I think, the kind of system uh, that is the, the information processing within which uh, can 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 feasibly or plausibly rather uh, be 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 conceptualized as a as a sentient system. Mm. Um, I must like for for example, Mark. On um, when I came into this podcast or when I first started thinking about consciousness, I'm I'm very much sim on a similar page as you. I think I think we're both very monist, physicalist. We're, we're trying to reduce it, trying to figure out a nice biological approach to it, but. I must say someone who came very close to really changing that my mind on that a little bit was Donald Hoffman. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Yes, uh, uh, I'm not in detail, but yes, I know the basic ideas. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty fascinating to see that a lot of physicists nowadays are starting to show that space time itself is not a concept that we can actually understand or 
or really even perceive in any real way. And, and therefore, well, now when he takes it further by obviously making the, his own conclusion that conscious agents must be fundamental. We're, we're, so that's a, a separate story. But what is a bit strange is the fact that physicists are not showing us that the reality that we're trying to reduce is not a reality that is possibly reducible because we see we have absolutely no access to this reality. What do you think about that? Well, um, so if you if you you or any of our viewers um, read my book uh, in 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 the penultimate chapter, uh, I, I it's it's titled "Back to the Cortex," uh, and there uh, I speak about. So the most of the book is about affect. It's about you know this fundamental form of consciousness and how it is generated and what that what the implication oh sorry it's not the penultimate chapter it's the third last chapter uh, the second last chapter is on traumas and the hard problem the last chapter is on artificial consciousness the third last chapter is on this 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 question of uh, of of uh, cognitive and perceptual consciousness you know the, the 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 type of consciousness that that we have for for for, for the most part focused on and there i make the argument which is again not not a, a a novel argument it's 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 very similar to Hoffman's uh, although I don't cite him because actually to, I'm embarrassed to admit I didn't yet know his work at the time that I was writing uh, that book but, but I was aware of other people in the predictive processing tradition you know like uh, like Andy Clark uh, and and uh, and Jakob Huey uh, speaking about you know perception as controlled hallucination yeah. um, and that you know the the, the reality and and dan dennett uh, you know the the this whole thing of the the user illusion and so on and uh, anil, i find yeah anil seth i mean that whole group of them anil seth is in that same tradition anil seth extends it from the extra receptive domain to the interreceptive domain in very interesting ways um, I actually, if we have time, I will come back to that because I, I think that the that that the, the in, that affect is not the same as interception. Uh, you know, I I I I I have a little a little quibble about that, but I don't think it's important for for our present purposes. So, what I'm saying is that in that tradition, with, with although Hoffman doesn't come from a predictive processing background, I think it's 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 entirely. Um, Compatible, you know, the idea that the reality that we are um, that we are acting in uh, is a representation of the, of of something in my language beyond the mark of blanket. All I can know is my blanket states, um, and uh, that that is a that is a, 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 a statistical generative model, you know, uh, 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 of 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 the of reality. I mean, it's you could even say Kant. It's a Kantian view, you know. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, so, but you know, I don't think it's a sp and there's anything spooky about that, uh, and and I, I don't think that it requires us. I mean, you, all you need to say is the retina, the retinal rods and cones, light waves impinge on the retina, uh, and the those cells transduce those light waves into nerve impulses. Uh, so what we, um, you know, you, you never actually are, you're not, the, you're not receiving light waves, uh, you are representing them as spike drains. You know, that, that, that's enough for me. It's, you can see there's nothing spooky there, you know, and those spike drains, all they are are ones and zeros. So from that, I, I, I then have to infer the, 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 the the causes of these of these uh, sensations, in other words, of these signals, and I and I model it. You know, I I I'm 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 perfectly fine with that. Um, so I I but 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 you know I don't see why that leads to all kinds of spooky conclusions. That's that's uh, there are a few steps beyond that that I don't think follow. When I spoke to Donald, when I asked him about it, because, because, I mean, a lot of us in biology, in neuroscience, we know that we don't see reality, a veridical sort of truth. We, we sort of represent something. Yeah. But his physics and his work with a couple other mathematicians show that space-time is fundamentally 
completely different. So we're not even seeing a mild representation or like something similar to reality or close. It's completely different. But he does eventually say that. However, his conclusion that consciousness must be fundamental is something he's willing to accept might be wrong. He's just trying to figure out a different solution. So he, he actually doesn't take it to that point where he, he claims that consciousness is fundamental. Yeah. He's just trying to find some yeah. alternative because reality is the problem. In essence, we, don't, we know a lot about mind, but we know almost nothing about matter, pretty much. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Uh, but by the way, as you can see, my lights came on. So, so hallelujah. Um, the, the load shedding has ended for, 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 I hope mine for the moment. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's hope there's not a reciprocal interaction between where you are and where I am. Um, but look, uh, there's, there's much that I could say um, about, um, about uh, quantum physics and uh, the, 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 the seriously uh, strange nature of reality and how utterly different it is from the from the high level average states that we are able to represent uh, and so on. You know, the, the, and, and those things all interest me very much. Uh, I, I will just say about that, that the, 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 the approach that Carl Friston and I take, uh, which is the free energy principle approach, um, it, it's called variational free energy. This is, this is you know, there's, there's thermodynamic free energy, um, and there's chemical free energy, and then there's informational free energy, and and some people, no less than James, for example, thinks the informational um, free energy is is the fundamental explanation of of of, of the thing. Um, the 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 all of those are probabilistic. It's a probabilistic theory. Uh, it, the variational free energy has to do with statistical mechanics. It has to do with probabilities. When I was speaking earlier about you know your uncertainty uh, and 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 the palpating of your uncertainty and all of that, we're talking about probabilities, um, and so I think that there's a very deep link. Is that there's a I think that the, the the whole free energy principle inherits from the traditions uh, that that have replaced Newtonian um, uh, uh, physics. So, so there's there's that in all of that interests me very much. But I, I, in the time remaining to us, I would rather, uh, because I'm aware we have limited time remaining, I would rather start with this observation, which is, which is uh, more concrete. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm a clinician. I work with neurological and, and uh, 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 neurosurgical patients uh, every day. And so I witness, you know, what happens if a piece of your brain is missing. Um, and I've been around for a sufficient number of years to have seen many, many, many patients with the same piece of their brain missing. And the curious, well, the interesting fact is that they all misperceive reality in the same way. You know, that, that uh, for example, uh, an excellent example is right parietal uh, lobe uh, patients uh, who, 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 who they're paralyzed on the left side and they believe they're not. Yeah. And it's patently obvious that they are, you know, but they say, no, I'm not. And so, you know, you see one and another and another, and eventually you realize, hang, you know, if you haven't got a right parietal lobe, you just, there's a piece of reality that you just don't get and never can get. Why? Because you've got a piece of your brain missing that you need in order to be able to get that. So you can, from that observation, uh, you, can, you can extrapolate that, well, all of us, have a piece of our brains missing in the sense that you know we we only have this what if we were to all have an additional lobe or an additional hemisphere how much more would we be able to to register and compute and comprehend you know than we currently do so so all i'm saying there is that i again on the basis of my own empirical clinical experience you know i'm totally ready to believe that we have a horribly limited conception and perception of reality. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, in, I'm totally sympathetic uh, with that. However, you know, we are where we are. So you can either say, okay, I'm going to become a mystic, you know, because I don't know anything. I'm just going to believe everything. Or, you know, it's, or, you, or you say, 
well, you know, given given the limited nature of my instrument, you know, I must do the best I can to 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 expand its bounds, um, to test my hypotheses, um, and uh, you know, be ready to find that my predictions were wrong, and I must update my predictive model and so on. I don't see what else we can do. I, so 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 although I am totally aware of the limits of the of the human brain it's just obvious from what i've just said and of the limits of science because it's a method it's a it's a method um ultimately you have to have we were talking about idealism and never got back to it uh, but you know ultimately you have to have faith and i use that word advisedly that there is some reality beyond what i'm perceiving that i'm probing and that you know I, that, I, that the, 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 the inferences um, that I draw uh, and the models that I build uh, each time are less bad, you know, that, that, I, that they, 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 of course, they're not reality. Of course, they are a, a, a pathetic, um, you know, scrap, scrap of what we are capable of grasping of the nature of the universe, really. But it's, but we're making progress, each of us in our own lives, and as a species over generations, we, 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 we have less bad models, less, less bad understandings. And, but it is all based on faith, you know, that, that this method uh, is a reasonable way of, of, of proceeding. Um, it is a matter, you know, you really can say, well, because it's so limited, because it's so, so um, unknowable, reality in itself and all of that i'm just going to give up that that's another approach that but i would rather take the scientific approach i just think we need to have humility as scientists and recognize how how little we know but the very physics that hoffman um, uh, uh, um, cites as evidence for how little we know is the product of that method you know that it has led us to know that reality is weird and it is very different from from how we perceive it, but but um, you know Hoffman couldn't have couldn't have come to that view if it wasn't for the application of the scientific method to arrive at that physics in the first place. When Hoffman when Hoffman so apparently he did the calculations and he and he asked like what are the probabilities of that our perception of reality would give us an accurate representation of reality based on natural selection and fitness and actually evolving and surviving. And, he, and when, when, he, when he noticed that the probability came to zero, he apparently had to take a seat because he's very much a scientist and he loves the scientific method, natural selection, all of it. So he had to take a seat because it like messed him up with his fundamental perception of reality because he was very much materialistic thinker in terms of consciousness. And so it's, it's it, on that note, if what are you you spoke about faith there mark i mean part of this podcast also is for the people questioning these big topics often are trying to also find meaning and purpose while not understanding what's really going on what are you, what are your religious or spiritual beliefs um first of all i want to come back one step in our conversation uh, to this materialist the idea of materialist and mind versus matter and so on uh, you know i to me, mind and matter are the same as what I was saying earlier when I said that there's a there's a dual aspect to our monistic essence. Uh, matter for me is an aspect. In other words, I don't think matter is a fundamental property. I think matter is a way of representing things, and and that's entirely consistent also with the 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 the, the, the recent physics that we were talking about earlier. Uh, matter is not a fundamental property uh, of the universe and uh, the, the 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 um so i'm not a materialist uh this segues into your question now you know i i i am not a materialist i i'm a i'm a dual aspect monist who says that the material uh, and the ideal uh, that these are two different ways of knowing of perceiving uh, something which is ultimately unknowable and this is what you and I have just been talking about, the limits of science, the humility that scientists have to have in the face uh, you know, of, the, of, the, of the massive uncertainties uh, uh, in, in the universe. So, so my spiritual position 
uh, it, it, it arises from that. In other words, it's one of humility. Uh, I, I'm sorry, maybe you've got the impression of me as a kind of a, 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 a pompous or noisy uh, guy. I don't know. It, 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 it might be hard for you to, to equate my, my personality with humility. But it really it is, as a scientist and as a, a, as a spiritual being, my, not only is it my belief, I even find solace in it, Tevin. I find solace in what I don't know. I think, like, what do I know? I don't know. You know, these things are way beyond my ken. Questions like what happens after I die, they're not empirical questions. I can't, any prediction I come up with, I can't test it until I'm dead, you know. So, so, and I accept that. And I, I say again, I take, I take comfort in it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a God? Um, you know, is there an afterlife? What does it all mean? You know, I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, and and uh, and uh, so it's a kind of an agnostic position, but it is not a materialist and not an atheist position. Yes. Um, but but within that, within those parameters, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of repeating myself. I then have to say, okay, given those limitations, what is to be done? And I say, well, you've got to do the best you can with what you've got. And so, you know, the the so the best I've been able to come up with is science. You know, I, I've read, okay, which of these things, you know, which of these things gives me the greatest confidence that, well, yeah, I might find answers, or at least I might find less ignorance. Uh, that, that's that's the approach that 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 I take, uh, fully fully uh, aware of the limits of the, uh, you know, the limits of the conclusions. Uh, th th that I can come to. Now, within that frame of reference, and this is probably be the last thing that we'll talk about, I, I, in other words, using a scientific um, methodology, uh, a scientific epistemology to, to try to address these questions, um, I, I think that um, our values, you know, I was talking much earlier in our conversation about the fundamental value system of living things is that it's good to survive and bad not to. Um, that, 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 that built upon those fundamental values are, 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 are other uh, also um, phenotypic values, mm. uh, you know, like, it's, like it's, it's bad to be in danger. That's fear. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's irritating and frustrating to have an impeding things preventing you from that's, that's, rage um you know that it's bad to separate a little dependent creature from its caregiver you know that that's got to do with attachment bonds and so on i think that these evolved um uh endophenotypes uh, is, is is a word that's sometimes used for them that they are they are basic values that we have just because we're living things and that they are then more elaborated values that we have just because we are mammals. And, and I, I think that these provide, and you know, it, it's famously said that you can't derive an ought from an is, but I think that from these is's, we can derive some oughts, like I've just done. Bad to separate, bad to, bad to injure people or injure living things. It's bad to, it's bad to, for sentient things rather, it's bad to, to separate mammals from their caregivers it's it's bad to 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 you know unnecessarily frustrate and impede sentient beings and so on i think that our much more elaborated human value systems which of course have evolved also to 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 manage um uh, much more artificial I mean, environments for which we were not um uh, evolutionarily prepared like 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 uh, you know uh, um agricultural and permanent settlements and, and, and everything that flowed from that, you know, private property and all of that. Uh, there's a lot more that's, that, that, that the values that we've built on top of those phenotypic values. But I think those phenotypic values and biological values are the starting point of all of our values, all of our values. They're not, they're not the values of the universe. They are our, mm. the values of us living things um, who have skin in the game.
I look, I love that, Mark. I mean, look, you didn't come across as pompous at, or arrogant in any way, and neither does your. Oh, I'm relieved. I loved reading it. I enjoyed it so much. I mean, it, there's something Raymond Tallis once said. I, I like this term. He says he's ontologically agnostic, but I mean, epistemologically, we trust science the most. Is what what you're basically trying to say. That's right. That's right. No, Mark, I thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed myself. Thank you. More words from your side? Well, thank you very much. And, and, and apologies again, as you can see, I've lost my, uh, this, is, uh, this is how unpredictable and uncertain the world is. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to be speaking to you as a fellow South African, and I'm glad that we are both here. Uh, these are the problems that belong to me. Uh, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm very happy to be grappling with them yeah. and, and proud to know that, 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 that you're a South African, uh, your, your, your podcast is just great. Thanks, Thanks Devin, for inviting me.